We have rights upon Allah. <laughs> Who assigns those rights? But here the Prophet ﷺ is saying, do you know what your right is upon Allah if you do that? I said, Allah and His Messenger know best. He said, "An la yu'adhibahum, that Allah will not punish them. Allah Azawajal will maintain His covenant so long as you maintain yours. Many of us were born into Islam, but never really got to know Allah to have that close connection. You know, insan can come from nesi, which means to be forgetful, but it also comes from uns, which means to be a sociable person, to have a connection. When you're forgetfulness, who do you turn to to have that connection? The dua of the disbelievers is useless. Allah says that if you seek victory, and you see it today with Netanyahu, and you see it with the IDF, you see it with the Israeli forces, they invoke scripture. That all of this is coming, this is a dua in a batil, a falsehood. Allah will not respond to it. Actually, He will respond to it and flip it onto them. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, everyone. Welcome back to Quran 30 for 30. The question from yesterday's juz, what are the two types of garments described in Surah Al-A'raf? Alhamdulillah, we're here. Joined by Sheikh Abdullah Duro. For some reason, he was doing this. And I was getting ready to like smack me or something like no, that. No, no, never, never. Alhamdulillah. And uh, our main man, Alhamdulillah, Dr. Rithman Omurji, yes, our director of research, survey evaluation, or survey. You, you have a, that's how you know you're important, man. We don't, we can't get your title. <laughs> so, it's, what is it? Survey, research, survey evaluation. Survey, research, and evaluation. Survey, Alhamdulillah. research. Did you know that, Sheikh? Yes, I did. You did? You yes, did. I did. Right. Alhamdulillah. 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 So oh, Dr. Usman does all the data work, alhamdulillah, Yaqeen runs the data work at Yaqeen and obviously publishes some really important research. Uh, I think actually probably one of the most underestimated aspects of our research at Yaqeen is the data work. I think you'd agree, right, Dr. Usman? There's, there's a lot of, everyone's doing great work. Everyone's doing great work, <laughs> alhamdulillah. But um, really researching trends and, and um, if you could talk to, just yeah. for a bit, like 30 seconds, Sorry. inshallah, like, where can people find the work that's being done at the data side and how can everyone benefit from it, institutions and individuals? Yeah, Jazakallah khair. So uh, on the main website, if you go to the read tab, uh, there's a section that has uh, reports and that's where you're gonna find almost all of our papers that use data. Um, you'll find things for Masajid. We have a re recent report on Imams and religious educators in North America. We have things on parenting. So if you go there, you'll find all the information. Alhamdulillah. So it's, it tells us exactly why people are losing faith and what gives people faith and what the trends are specific to our community. And every institution, every individual can benefit from that. Alhamdulillah. Are you responsible for Siri listening in on us? So like if we, if, if Siri hears someone say Allah does like feed them, are you, are you working with Siri? Astaghfirullah. Okay. No, no, no. You have a straight face. He's so serious a lot. No, because he was happy that we stopped dad jokes. So I was like, you're going to make it funny for him in particular. Yeah, that, that would be khalwa. It was me and Siri together. So no, we can't be doing that kind of stuff. Siri's so. with, with us all, right? So Jazakallah khair. Thanks for being with us. Inshallah ta'ala. With that, uh, we will go ahead and get started. Alhamdulillah. So we're in Juz 9. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So subhanAllah, there's this verse when we go through sort of al-an'am, uh, al-a'raf, al-anfal, there's a beautiful trend that you start to see of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, look, if you collectively as nations obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then collectively you will experience bliss. But then also when you collectively disobey, what more can you expect? Right? Of course, you're going to be punished with all the warnings that you've been given. And so Allah Azza extending the invitations time and time and time again to people to repent. And so here you have, subhanAllah, in uh, Surah Al-A'raf, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ Now we've reflected on this verse in previous seasons of Quran 30 for 30, and I... Uh, ask you once again to download the Quran 30 for 30 ebook where we talk about this verse compared to um, the verse in Surah Al-An'am which is very similar to it. But what I want to focus on actually, Allah Azza wa says, had the people of those societies been faithful and mindful in Allah. Amanu wa taqo. Iman saves them in the hereafter, taqwa saves them in the hereafter, but it also is a means of preserving what they have here as well. Sin depletes this world, Good deeds earn the favor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which has a benefit in the hereafter and a benefit in this world. Allah would have given them the barakah, the blessing of the heavens and the earth, or allowed the blessings to descend upon them uh, from the heavens uh, and, of course, within the earth, but they disbelieved. So Allah Azza wa says, فَأَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ This is what I want to focus on. 
We seize them for what they used to commit. Now we'll talk about punishment in the hereafter in the next years. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that punishment came to them in this dunya because of what they used to do in this dunya, right? And so it was a fitting punishment that came to them, a fitting compensation. Now when you fast forward to verse 101, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tilka al-qura naqussu alayka min anba'iha that we have narrated to you, O Prophet of Allah, some of the stories of these societies. Why? وَلَقَدْ جَاءَتْهُمْ رُسُلُهُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ And surely their messengers came to them with clear evidences. فَمَا كَانُوا لِيُؤْمِنُوا بِمَا كَذَّبُوا مِنْ قَبْلِ And they were not going to believe in what they had already decided they were going to deny. This is so important here. They had already decided that we're not going to believe and so they were not going to believe. And so someone might read the stories of these nations and say, you know, why weren't they given another chance? Do you know how many chances Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to these nations before he destroyed them? And indeed, Allah Azza wa when he says that we do not punish the people, until we send them a messenger. How many chances is every single individual sinner given to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How many wake up calls, how many reminders before the punishment actually comes to them? So they were not going to believe because they had already decided to deny. And this is what I want you to focus on, inshaAllah ta'ala, verse 102. وَجَدْنَا أَكْثَرَهُمْ لَفَاسِقِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we did not find most of them to stay true to their ahd, to their covenant. Rather, we found most of them to be truly rebellious. Now, by the way, the language here, Allah Azza wa says that most of the people indeed are going to be ungrateful. Right? And here, most of the people are not going to be loyal to the covenant they took with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whoever is ungrateful to the people is ungrateful to Allah. And a person who's not loyal to their covenant with Allah is going to manifest those traits of disloyalty and those traits of evil with people as well. So it's going to manifest itself in bad behavior with the people as well. They're not people of ahad. They're not people of trust. And the believers are people of amana. They're people of trust. They honor the trust with Allah and they honor the trust, the covenants with people uh, as well. So, you know, when you connect this to the previous juz, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us that you've seen these examples of history that you read about, but trust that Allah knows the human behavior better than you. And Allah knows what would have been with these people, what the qadr of these nations would have been. And all of the chances Allah gave to them that you didn't even read about in the Quran, right? Allah is just giving you the highlights of these nations before he destroyed them. And every single person who's punished in this dunya or in the hereafter was given sufficient warning. And his covenant to us, Allah's covenant to us is never broken by his side. Allah gave us a covenant like he gave a covenant to Adam alayhi salam. And I end here with the beautiful hadith of Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, where Mu'adh radiallahu anhu says, I was riding with the Prophet sallallahu And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, Ya Mu'adh ibn Jabal, O Mu'adh ibn Jabal, I said, here I am, O Messenger of Allah, here I am. Whatever it is that you want, Ya Rasulullah. And he says, Thumma sa'ra sa'atan. The Prophet وسلم, continued to ride. And then he called out to me again, and I responded again. And then he continued to ride, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the same thing happened. But here's what I want to get to. He said, Hal tadri ma haqqullahi ala al-ibad? O Mu'adh, do you know what the right of Allah is upon his slaves? Qala qultu Allahu wa Rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and his Messenger know best. He said, فَإِنَّ حَقَّ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْعِبَادِ أَنْ يَعْبُدُوهُ وَلَا يُشْرِكُوا بِهِ شَيْئًا The right of Allah upon the slaves is that they worship him and they don't associate partners with him. And then some time went on and he said, يَا مُعَاذَ بِنْ جَبَلْ Mu'adh said, what is it, Ya Rasulullah? Here I am, O Rasulullah, here I am. And he said, هَلْ تَدْرِي مَا حَقُّ الْعِبَادِ عَلَى اللَّهِ إِذَا فَعَلُوا ذَلَكَ Do you know what the right of the slaves is upon Allah if they do that? We have rights upon Allah. <laughs> Who assigns those rights? But here the Prophet ﷺ is saying, do you know what your right is upon Allah if you do that? I said, Allah and His Messenger know best. He said, and la yu'adhibahum, that Allah will not punish them. Allah Azza will maintain His covenant so long as you maintain yours. I said, Ya Rasulullah, afala ukhbiru biha nas? Shouldn't I go tell people this then? Fayastabashiru, they'll be so happy that that's all they have to do. And the Prophet ﷺ says, idan yatakilu that they'll become too complacent. Let the people work for Allah's pleasure. Let the people work for Allah's pleasure. But be people of Ahad. Know that you have a covenant with Allah and Allah does not betray His covenant. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects of you to do your best to fulfill the covenant. And when you're doing your best, 
then he will fill the gaps with what is indeed best and enter us ta'ala with his mercy into paradise, Allahumma ameen. With that, Abu Mu'af. I turn <laughs> to Sheikh Abu Mu'af. Barakul Afikum. Allahi Barakul. Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala amma ba'd. As a matter of fact, that's why I named my son Mu'ad, my oldest Mu'ad, because Mu'ad ibn Jabal, radiallahu anhum. Uh, meaning he was faqih, he was someone that was most knowledgeable of the halal and haram that's been mentioned, upon, mentioned about him, radiallahu anhum. I want to talk about particularly a characteristic that Mu'adh and all of the companions uh, carried and had. And that is a characteristic of using their obedience as a shield against the actions of disobedience. And some would term it, term it as taqwa, some would term it as fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it's known to be taqwa. But the word fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one dimension of taqwa. Taqwa is a very comprehensive term. It's more of having mindfulness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's names and attributes. And as a result of it, one will have fear of him. One will be mindful of his greatness, therefore having fear of him. One will be mindful of his greatness, therefore knowing his wisdom, which when they do an action, they realize because of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's predestination that he put this in front of me and that he has gotten me to this point because of my previous efforts, which he knows also from the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's able to bring harm, allow harm to come, and he's also, also the one that brings benefit. Naf'an wa dar. So when understanding comprehensively who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is via by knowing his names and attributes, this is how one can maintain, obtain and maintain taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a beautiful verse, and as a matter of fact, this verse, it reminds me when I, when I went to study in Al-Medina, I was in the airport, one of my mentors took me to the airport, and right before, you know, we're sitting there waiting and I'm nervous about to go and study my first year. And right before I leave for boarding, he stops me. He says, he mentions this verse, this very verse here. He says, after Allah Muhammad Shaitan Jimmy said, remember, Abdullah. Ya yuha ladhina amnu in tattakullaha yaja'allakum furqanan wa yukafir ankum sayyatikum yukfir lakum wallahu dhul fadlil azim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, believers, if you fear Allah, if you're mindful of Allah, he will grant you a criterion and will cleanse you of your sins and forgive you. For verily Allah is the Lord of, abound, of abounding bounty. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's a jumla sharti, it's a conditional sentence, meaning that if you are able to have or possess or strive to get this characteristic, you will receive the following. So if I tell like my son, for instance, clean your room, you will receive this amount of money or this reward. Cleaning your room is a condition to get that reward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in taqullah, what's the result? Yaj'al lakum furqanan. So, O oh, you who believe, firstly calling out those that have trust, belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The belief in the creator of the heavens and the earth is what is most important. Many of us were born into Islam, but never really got to know Allah to have that close connection. You know, insan can come from nesi, which means to be forgetful, but it also comes from uns, which means to be a sociable person, to have a connection. When you're forgetfulness, who do you turn to to have that connection? To have, to, who do you rely on to come closer to, which brings a form of serenity and brings a form of tranquility within your soul, which will further result in doing actions of khair. So when you understand and you are of the believer, believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, if you are mindful of him, he will give you the criterion. Why did my mentor tell me this when I was going to the plane? Because as you're studying the religion, you may encounter certain differences of opinion. You may understand something differently than what was intended from your teacher. You know, students, there may be some friction. And this is in every place of education. He said, remember, have, be mindful of Allah. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do your best to be mindful of his presence, that he is always there. And when you're mindful of that, inshallah, that will penetrate the heart to where it will have a result in your actions. And that is the shahid, the highlighted portion that I want to capitalize on here. He will give you the criterion. He will give you that which allows you to clearly see truth from falsehood. How many of us, subhanAllah, we're doubtful of matters and we don't know where to go. Sometimes we're trying to practice our faith and we've, there's, a, there's a particular issue in our life, we can't find the answer. 
And sometimes shaitan will make us think that we can independently find it without any godly guidance. That's why it's important within, when, when you're faced with any trial or tribulation, whether it's something even academic that you're trying to understand, stop, put your hands up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh Allah, ma'ihdini sa'a sabeel. When you say, ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem, have that trial that you're facing, that you're facing in your heart and in your mind while you are in salah, that is the process. He will make it clear for you, the Furqanin, and then as a result, He will what? He will forgive you of your sins and cleanse you. He will cause his sins to be expiated for and he will cleanse you. And what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? And he is the one that is full of virtue and abounding bounty. And that is important to know because it is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is a repository of all of these virtues that we know and that we want and as a matter of fact, that we need. In conclusion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what we need regardless of what we want. When we ask the one that really understands what we need and trust in him, he will give us the benefit and the bounty and the love and the honor of being able to see truth from Falsehood. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of the muttaqeen, make us of those that are aware of his presence and allow that awareness to shine through in actions of obedience. Dr. Smafi. Allah barik fi. A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa wala. So I would like to reflect over some of the ayat from Surah Al-Anfal. And the reason I would like to do this is that subhanAllah these last few months as we're all dealing with the crisis uh, and, the, and the genocide in Gaza, I believe it to be one of the most important surahs that for Muslims to study because it gives us a blueprint for success. It gives us a blueprint for victory. And the way I want to speak about this today is to actually talk about how important it is that we understand the maghazi, the battles of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu because within that there are going to be those lessons that we need to apply for today. SubhanAllah, uh, you know, so many athar statements of the righteous, Zain al-Abideen, Right, the great grandson of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he used to say that we used to be, we were taught the, the maghazi of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just like we were taught a chapter from the Qur'an. Meaning it was something that was done continuously, repetitively, until it became part and parcel of who they were. And in particular, Surah Al-Anfal and the maghazi literature, you can think about it in two different ways. One way is to think about it from the lens of books of seerah. And in books of Sirah, what you find is that when we speak about the battles of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you see a lot about the historical facts. How many people, Battle of Badr, of course, the Anfal is all about the great Battle of Badr. Yom al-Furqan, so you said, if you fear Allah, then Allah will give you, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he'll give you the criterion, right? That uh, those, the Sirah literature will tell you how many Muslims were there. Battle of Badr, about 300-ish, 320, right? How many disbelievers are around 900 to 1,000? It'll tell you who was martyred and all these different facts about who, what, where, when, why. When we turn to Surah Al-Anfal, you actually see a very different discussion of this battle. What you find is that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala He actually puts those details to the side and He wants to uncover for us the spiritual and psychological mindsets and states that are necessary that will bring about the victory of Allah Azza wa Jal or that will lead to loss and defeat. And one of those things I wanna focus on today is that so many Muslims are psychologically defeated, which means once you psychologically are defeated, you cannot defeat your, your enemy in any other situation. Mm -hmm. And this, by the way, applies in any sport you're playing or any competition. If I'm gonna be playing someone uh, in basketball, right, or in any other sport, and I think that my opponent is stronger than me, they're more capable than me, then I've already lost the battle. Mm -hmm. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Anfal, He uncovers numerous elements for us to reframe how we see ourselves and we see the enemy. And you hear subhanAllah today, so many things people say, well, how, when you read the Quran, it should all, it's all about Gaza these days, right? Every ayah you can apply it to Gaza. And people say, look, the Zionists, they're so powerful. The Zionists, they have so much money. The Zionists, there are so many. We are few, we are poor, right? We are weak. And Allah in, in, in Surah Al-Anfal actually flips this narrative. Because Quraysh in the Battle of Badr was triple the number of the Muslims, right? There were about a thousand, the Muslims were about 300. They had more money, the Muslims actually had very few weapons, Quraysh was fully armed. So every kind of material aspect of battle was on the side of the disbelievers. And so Allah wanted to reframe for the believers so they could actually go into the battle with hope and with courage. And just a couple of insights. So number one, I wanna speak about the fact that we don't look at the, at the Zionists or as, our, as the enemies of Islam as being big and powerful. Allah says in, in, in Surah Al-Anfal, He says, 
إِذْ يُرِيكَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنَعْمِكَ قَالِيلًا First thing he wants to do is change our perception. Don't think about the enemy as being this large, massive, powerful entity. Allah says, and we showed them to you in your dreams, when you were sleeping, as few. That Allah is saying, had we made them appear to you as plenty and abundant and large, you would have lost hope. You would have lost courage and you would have begun to argue. Say, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't do anything. We should sit back. We can't overcome them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spared you of that. Allah. So the lesson for us is that when you look at the Zionists or you look at any other enemy of Allah, look at them for the weakness that they have. Their numbers do not avail them. And that goes to the second point. When Abu Jahl goes to the battlefield and he makes dua, he, ta- he asks Allah for victory. In tastaftihu faqad al fatah. He goes and he says, oh Allah, the ones who are more, uh, whoever of these two parties is cut, cutting off ties of kinship, right? Then destroy them. Whoever you love more, then give them victory. And then the surah, the ayah continues. And Allah says, وَلَن تُغْنِيَ عَنْكُمْ فِيَتُكُمْ شَيْئًا, شَيْئًا وَلَوْ كَثُرَتْ That no matter how many groups and parties you have with you, it will not avail you. And so we learn from this two things. Number one is the dua of the disbelievers is useless. Allah says that if you seek victory, and you see it today with Netanyahu, and you see it with the IDF, you see it with the Israeli forces, they invoke scripture. That all of this is coming, this is a dua in a batil, a falsehood. Allah will not respond to it. Actually, he'll respond to it and flip it onto them. And number two, no matter how powerful, uh, how large they seem, it will not avail them. And the third point I want to make as I conclude is that people today are worried that the Zionists have so much money and that we cannot compete with them financially. And to remind ourselves of the ayah in the surah where Allah says, People who disbelieve, the disbelievers will spend an enormous amount of money for the purpose of diverting people from the way of Allah. That let them spend their money, they will spend it in abundance, then it will be a cause of regret and remorse for them, and then they will be overcome. So we look at ourselves and our situation, we might be few, but Allah is with us. We might have less money, but our money has barakah. When we make dua, إِذْ تَسْتَغِيثُونَ رَبَّكُمْ فَاسْتَجَابَ لَكُمْ When we make dua, Allah will respond to our dua. And once you reframe yourself and you see the Zionists for who they truly are, then it gives us hope and it gives us the courage to continue to do everything we need to do. And that is a step to being psychologically and spiritually prepared so we get the Nasr of Allah Azza wa Jal. We ask Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala to bring about all the Amen. means of victory through our efforts and our efforts are simply not the cause, but it's the step that is needed to bring about the victory of Allah Azza wa Jal. We ask Allah to support our brothers and sisters in Gaza and to give them victory. Oh my, I mean, Subhan Rabbi Kira Bil Aizati Amma Sifun wa Salamun al Mursaleen, Walhamdulillah Bil Alameen. Allah Yu Barakrik Ahsant. You know, SubhanAllah, I was thinking about Walau Anna Ahl al Qura Amin wa Taqa wa Fatahna Alayhim Barakat bin Samai wa Lar. There are people who have no blessing in their possession, and there are people mm-hmm. who have no power in their power. Hmm. There's actually emptiness there. And you know, one of the things that I think about with the apartheid wall, which existed obviously before the genocide in Gaza and continues to exist. Hmm. Right? Even though Allah is describing, of course, the hereafter, those that are in and those that are out. If you were to look from above at just the material, if you had like a drone looking at, you know, those that live in Allah al Gharbiya, those that live in the West Bank, and those that live in Tel Aviv and those that live in these, you know, well-established material cities. I have no doubt that a person living in Jenin has more happiness than a person living in Tel Aviv. No doubt, right? More baraka, more blessing, more fulfillment, more meaning than a person living in Tel Aviv and who is enjoying the fruits of apartheid and genocide and occupation and resigned to this world and thinks that that, that God has chosen them to, to be able to do this. You're absolutely right, subhanAllah. Think about all of the words of mockery, all of the structures of power, everything that they've spent coming back and confronting them on the day of judgment. Think about how small they would feel, subhanAllah, on that day. They don't have it. There's something missing there. And faith is what makes meaning. And so without faith, they have no meaning and they have no meaning and they have no purpose. And that's why their desire is to humiliate and to, uh, to dishonor because all they want is that, right? It's no different than the, the base 
drive that the mushrikeen had to mutilate the believers, mm. right? And to see their bodies as corpses and to, to celebrate, right? What's the difference between someone that wants to drink alcohol, wine out of the skull of one of the Sahaba mm. and one of these people, the enemies of Allah today that, that wants to mutilate and that, you know, like, like subhanAllah, how they humiliate themselves. You see these soldiers posing with the lingerie of the woman that they kill, Stop with the right. toys Stop of the children that they kill. And they think that they're boasting and they think that they're, they think that they look, you know, like, like people of victory, but they're humiliating themselves and Allah will humiliate them on the day of judgment for that too. So they don't have barakah in their possession. They don't have power in their power. And, you know, alhamdulillah, for the ni'mah of faith, for the blessing of faith that allows us to find meaning, even in these trials and tribulations. And alhamdulillah for a people of faith, like those in Gaza and Palestine that are showing us that even under these circumstances, that they have a pathway, that they have a purpose, that they have a reason to keep on going. And we must keep on going with them in the night time. No, it's, it's important. I mean, you know, you mentioning those images. I know that the soldiers are making a mockery and, you know, people are spending their money. Allah SWT says they are going to continue spending. But Allah says, Thum alayhim hasra. So it's knowing the future from what Allah SWT tells us. But as you mentioned beautifully, that the effort is part of the process. It's not because of my effort. The predestination and the effort go hand in hand. Right? And that's very, very important for the believer is that we know what Allah SWT has promised us, but that does not dismiss us of being active and making the effort. And I think that's very, very, very important because sometimes, you know, we'll see what's on social media. And we're like, oh, man, we're defeated. Oh, man, they have all this money. Right. We'll see all these people here and what's going on. And it looks as though we are defeated. But we've seen, subhanAllah, with people reaching out, with people going out, protesting, getting online, offline, being active, being vocal, not taking no for an answer. It's definitely having an impact. But while they're in that process as well, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will assist them as long as they are pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that intention is pure and solid and they just keep moving. I think that's what is so, so beautiful because when people from the outside looking in see that and they see what's going on with our brothers and sisters in Gaza, they're like, man, there's something that is driving them beyond the tangible things that we see here. It's something beyond. Because as a matter of fact, the more you push, the more we will push. Fazadahum iman. When it's, when the, when the, when those elements of doubt to try to oppress you psychologically, فخشوهم, you should fear them. Look at everything what's going on. How? imanan. And what did they say? The same thing that we we're hearing, my brothers and sisters, Hasbunallah wa ni'ma wakil. So I think it's, it's very, very important, subhanAllah, to know that both go hand in hand. What, what, what you're starting with is a taqwa and the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which will allow you to distinguish the truth from falsehood, but you keep moving, bismillah, and that with that you cannot lose. Even if you die. And I think that point is so beautiful because even if Allah takes you in that process, that is a success as well. You know, we, that's the martyr. And that's when Allah SWT is speaking about those that we were seeing consistently on, on our phones and on television, etc. So may Allah SWT have mercy upon those that have died in his cause. And may Allah SWT have, you know, bless us, you know, give us mercy in being of those that are abiding by his sharia and Amen. making sure that we are staying steadfast on that. Amen. 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 You have a final thought. Yeah, I was just going to add to this last point about just even though they have all the means, they have none of the barakah. And mm -hmm. if we have less means, we have all the barakah. And so Allah said mm -hmm. in Surah Al-Anfal, فَلَمْ تَقْتُلُوهُمْ وَلَكِنْ اللَّهَ قَتَلَهُمْ وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنْ اللَّهَ رَمَيْتَ Like it's, it's not our efforts that are directly causing this, right? It's okay. Allah is when, no matter what we do, when the Prophet Islam threw that dust, he had to throw the dust. But it's Allah who made that dust hit their eyes to then allow things to happen. And there's, I'll conclude with one story that to me is, is, is beautiful. It's when Abbas, Right, uh, but when he was he was a disbeliever and he fought in against the Muslims in Badr, he gets captured, right? And then some tiny, short, stout Sahabi comes from Ansar and he's like, "Look, I got Abbas, I got you know this 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 warrior, right? Oh, yes, right, yeah." And and Abbas is like, he feels like humiliated. This little guy, Gami, he's like, "Yeah, he's like Muhammad. Is, he didn't capture me. There was some like <laughs> handsome man on this like beautiful horse, and he's the guy who captured me. And then the Sahabi is like, "No, it was me. I got it." And the Prophet said, "What's good, right? Like, be quiet." You know, in Allah ayyadika bi malakin kareem. Like Allah supported you with like a noble angel, but the guy still made the effort, mm -hmm. and the Allah took the enemy, you know, by this, you know, by, you know, by, you know, allowed him by His hand to take him there. So, so we trust in Allah Azza wa Jal, and and we do our part, and the results are upon Him, and that is what tawakkul is, right? So. And I think it's important to also say, فَسَيُنْفِقُونَهَا Who's spending yeah. 
the U.S. government, uh, mm -hmm. it will be a cause of regret. APAC, all the billions exactly. of dollars, millions of dollars will be a cause of regret. The entire Israeli propaganda machine will be a cause of regret in this life and in the next. And alhamdulillah, we can see that collapse in front of us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, give our brothers and sisters victory and to make us Amen. part of that victory as well. Allahumma ameen, jazakallah khair. Shaykh Abdullah, Shaykh Uthman, inshallah we'll see you all tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.